So welcome to this Meet the Experts session, uh, which will focus on ISSA's uh, Financial Crime Compliance Questionnaire. My name is Karen Zeeb and I'm the company secretary at ISSA and I'm joined by Olivia Goffard, who is the head of group compliance and ethics at Euroclear, who is our expert today. Welcome, Olivier. Hello, Karen. Hello, everybody. So why are we here? Um, in 2014, the <clears throat> ITSA Financial uh, Compliance and Control Working Group started working on a set of 17 FCC principles. The objective was to create a set of principles along with a due diligence questionnaire that could be implemented by the security service industry globally to address the critical challenges posed by financial crime. Since the initial launch of the principles, the due diligence questionnaire has been extensively reviewed based on market feedback. And therefore, we thought this was an opportune time to take a step back, see where we are in the implementation of the FCC principles and highlight the most salient points of the new questionnaire. Therefore, Olivier, first question for you. Why is there this focus on the financial crime risks in the securities business? You know, uh, Karen, um, I've been following the, the, that exercise that has been led by ESA to reinforce the awareness regarding the risk of uh, financial crime in the securities business since 2014. And it has been quite a journey. And at the time, uh, I must say that we have been confronted with uh, certain statements from regulators that have been an eye opener. There's been cer also certain court cases that um, again were not necessarily anticipated and that has translated to the need for a more robust, more articulated control environment with regards to financial crime risk in the securities industry. And I will read one sentence that is uh, a quote from a recent or more or less recent uh, couple of years ago a paper from the FATF, the risk based approach in the security sector. And you will see that they have highlighted pretty clearly what the risk is. And again, I'm quoting them. Securities markets are often characterized by complexity, internationality, a high level of interaction, high volumes, speed, and anonymity. Let's say that when you put all of that together, uh, it's an explosive cocktail. Uh, let's go a little bit more into the details and wh what they mean. Because that's, I will certainly not challenge them. We are working in a complex, complex environment. So first thing, what, what you should know is that a traditional in a traditional custody chain, in between the end buyer and seller of securities and the ultimate custodian, you have on average eight intermediaries that are playing a role in this custody chain. When you know that most of the securities transactions are global, uh, with a high level of inter interconnectedness between markets, again, it adds an additional level of complexity. No need to mention the speed of transactions, but the, the one point I want to focus on that is a key differentiator with the cash aspect is that the, the, at each moment of the transaction, at each step of a, tra of a transaction, the beneficial ownership of securities is being modified, is being changed. And when I spoke, when I told you that there were eight stakeholders in, a, in the typical custody chain, obviously those stakeholders do not have a view on the complete intermediaries within the, the chain. And except if you are in a full beneficial on the market, they also do not have a view of who the end buyer and sellers are. So you are on top of that confronted to a market where the information is fragmented and each stakeholder is only, is only seeing one part of the whole transaction chain. All of those elements plus others obviously are, tri are triggered in 2014 that reflection at ESA level and that's where ESA level has taken the lead in that very critical exercise for the securities industry. Thank you. So could, could you, at this stage, Olivier, give us some concrete examples of how securities could be misused? Oh, yeah. Um, 
So the, the, the main one, that, or the, the easiest one, I should say, that's coming to my mind is pump and dump. You know, the, that uh, famous scheme by which uh, the price of a security is being artificially inflated, usually through misleading statements, and that the, the fraudster is uh, selling that security at the highest level before the price crashes, which is typically the dump on this side. So that, that's a, a, an easy example. Mm -hmm. Uh, another one, uh, if we speak about AMN and bribery, and it's a nice combination of both, is the, one MD, the famous 1MDB case uh, by which a governmental Malaysian investment fund uh, has issued, uh, I can't remember exactly the amount, but uh, an impressive amount of go governmental bonds, bonds uh, supposedly used to, to be used for public development projects, but out of which 4.5 billions of dollars have been uh, siphoned, I think is the, the term you use, used to, for private gains, amongst others, the Prime Minister of Malaysia and uh, the guy who was running that uh, that investment fund. And uh, just for, for the little story, uh, the the kind of things that they, the, they, did, they did with that money was not only to buy uh, flats, luxury flats in New York, cities, yachts, or other luxury goods, but also they have fund, funded the, the Wolf of Wall Street, the movie. So, you know, uh, <laughs> how to take a dark money and use it to other uh, other purposes. Um, I probably have two other examples that are coming in mind. Uh, sanctions. Uh, we've seen more recently, or the, probably, uh, again, since 2014, 2015, that uh, EU and US regulators have been very inventive in creating sanctions regime that are targeting specifically the, the securities industry and therefore creating restrictions on securities or issuers that need to be implemented by security stakeholders. And, uh, and the last one is another one that is, uh, it, everything I'm saying is public, obviously, is the tax fraud. Tax fraud with the famous cum, cum ex scheme by which uh, true uh, ar dividend arbitrage and playing uh, playing with the dividend payment dates. Some some stakeholders managed to get uh, um, the um, the tax reclaims to be paid twice for the same securities or the same gains. So again, those are only illustrations. But I, I I've tried I've tried to give you a wide scope of different areas: tax fraud, AML, corruption, sanctions, just to evidence that it's not a theoretical risk. Changing tack a little bit now um, and, and thinking about uh, the work that ISSA did with the, the principles and, and the <coughs> questionnaire, um, most people already know that the, we already have the Wolfsburg principles and the Wolfsburg questionnaire. So does ISSA's work duplicate that at all? You know, I, I, was, I was moderating a similar session at Cybos. It was in, in, in other, other times. It was still physically in Singapore. So I was, I was not shut down in my office, uh, but it's not so, that was so long ago. It was in 2015 or 2016, and we've made a poll to the audience at the time. And it was quite appealing to realize that amongst all the audience present, 50% present, of the people in the room were not screening their securities transactions. Uh, and I open her again. Um, that's when we started to dig, to dig a little bit deeper in the Warsberg questionnaire. And what we've seen is that the securities specific challenges that we were facing were actually not included at all into the, the, the two main uh, Warsberg questionnaires. So where we, we see that the Warsberg questionnaire is certainly, or the Warsberg questionnaires are certainly very useful and state of the art in terms of management of the risk, in terms of cash and correspondent banking activities, we see the ESA questionnaire as being a very nice complement. And that's exactly the reason why we have tried not to replicate questions that were already covered in the Warsberg questionnaire, but to focus on what's really specific for the securities market. Thank you. So, and to date, what do the regulators think of ISA's approach? Uh, we have, we have um, engaged quite significantly with uh, regulators worldwide, either local regulators or institutions like uh, IOSCO. And I must say that even if uh, their reaction has been very positive, uh, they appreciated a lot the fact that the industry took a stab 
at uh, being proactive and self-regulating itself in a way. Uh, fair to say that what they, they, the proof is in the pudding, you know, and they said it's very good, but for the moment it's still a theoretical framework. So uh, let's see what it gives and whether you manage to create sufficient traction around those principles so that it's mainly supported by the big players, because ESA, let's face it, is mainly represented by the big players, but also by, by all those other stakeholders, you know, my famous eight intermediaries in the chains, that they also uh, play the game. And that's, that's where we are for the moment. Uh, I don't have any specific inside information to give you, but uh, at least for my specific uh, institution, uh, we had in very recent interactions on the principles and how we had embedded it into our own processes. And the reaction has been pretty positive. And I know that in some of the markets is the case as well. So in practice, moving on from that point, and as you say, in practice, do market participants complete the questionnaire? And what are you doing to ensure that the questionnaire is accessible and that it is adopted? Okay, there are probably different questions uh, or sub questions. Um, how do we make sure that uh, participants use the questionnaire? Um, there are different means that we are we have used. First, the principles themselves, because the questionnaire is nothing more than a materialization, a tool to uh, facilitate the work of custodian in assessing whether or not their participants were, were uh, properly complying with the ESA principles. And those ESA principles mandate uh, the, the, the clarification of what is expected from the participants through contractual provisions. And this, one of those provisions include, amongst others, the requirement for the participants, so the clients, the account order of the custodian, to have a similar, similar contractual agreement with its own clients, and so and so on through the chain. So there is a there is or they, we we start to see a, a whole scheme of contractual provisions being set up in between the different participants, my eight participants in the transaction chain, uh, so that we can get a. a relatively good comfort that even the eighth stakeholder that is the closest to the end buyer and seller will also be complying with the principles. But that's that's not the only thing, obviously. Um, how do we make sure that the, the questionnaire is being used? It's because the questionnaire in some organization is being used as such uh, in due diligence exercise with their own clients or embedded in their own proprietary questionnaire. And through the questions that are being asked, it also gives a comfort that their client, their participants themselves are applying a similar due diligence level across the chain. So again, by that uh, that that network of questionnaire that is being filled in, we can get that comfort. Okay. I think your second question was about uh, how do we make it available, if I'm not mistaken? Yes, correct. Uh, but ESA makes it available. It. OK, uh, so ESA makes it available available on its website, obviously. Um, as I said, it's being embedded as well through, uh, through the fact that the main custodian, the main players on the market are creating a virtual circle uh, by using it themselves and making sure that their participants are using it and so on and so on. Uh, but on top of that, and it's very relevant for Cybos, we are working with SWIFT as we speak to make sure that it will be integrated as a, as a mandatory component to the SWIFT KYC baseline um, and its work in pro more than in progress. The, the work is being con con concluded and we expect that it's something that will be in a position to announce, if not at the end of this year, in the course of next year. Thank you. So <coughs> one last question for you and then we'll open it up to the audience in case they have any questions. Um, uh, and, and I think uh, probably quite a few people think like this, not necessarily about uh, uh, just financial crime compliance, but too often financial crime compliance is viewed as too much about form filling and not enough about protecting the system, the actual environment. So how can we make sure that ISA's approach is not short on effectiveness and actually works? Now, if I had the real answer to that question, I would I would uh, probably be very rich as a consultant. Um, the certainty, certainty, um, I will never be in a position to give you a certainty. What, what I can tell you, though, is that we are we have really made sure to. But first, it's not a new questionnaire that we are presenting here. It's a re revision of an existing questionnaire. 
and that revision has been based on feedback received from market participants. So we are we have tried to stick as much as possible to the challenges that uh, those market participants were facing in utilizing the first iteration of that questionnaire. And you will see when it will be made public, uh, compared to the current version, it's actually not an increase of questions that you will see, but a decrease of questions where we have tried to be much more to the point, pragmatic, concrete, and uh, really targeting the risks that are specific to the securities industry. Let me give you a few examples. Um, first, we have made it clear that we expected participants opening an account with custodians to perform some kind of monitoring on the securities themselves and certainly those securities that are considered as higher risk. Many stocks, certainly in the United States, is a, is a very relevant notion. Sanctioned securities, close-ended funds. So all those securities that are, by definition are creating a heightened risk of financial crime, we expect very clearly uh, a discussion, a dialogue in between the custodian and the account holder on what kind of due diligence they have been able to put in place. We have clarified, I told you that um, a few years ago, 50% of the audience was not screening securities transactions. There's obviously a question that is targeting to it. And we are making it clear that relevant information in the context of securities might be not only found in static data, so in the databases that are being run by audit intermediaries, as I'm thinking about information on, on an issuer, Perspective of the prospectus of an issuance, tax certificates, those are data that are not transactional by nature, but more static. And then obviously, uh, there are transactional data. And we know that in, uh, this, in securities, uh, sweet securities transaction fields, there might be quite a lot of information on beneficial owners, for example. That is the kind of thing we are expecting now institutions to systematically screen. So as to be able to detect any fishy security and to uh, again open the right dialogue, e either make the due diligence in that security and confirm that it's a, a false hit, if I can put it that way, or open the dialogue with the custodian to make sure that the custodian is not himself by uh, operating transactions on those custody, uh, putting its own compliance in jeopardy. Um, another example that's coming to mind is that uh, we have inserted um, a dedicated question to uh, re regarding what we call clean cash payments. Uh, what are clean cash payments? Clean cash payments are uh, at least for uh, those institutions that are uh, operating a securities business. There is an expectation that the cash transactions that are that they are processing would be directly linked to their securities business. And that, for example, you want to try to uh, buy a yacht to somebody using a custodian, whilst you should actually do that kind of transaction in a traditional uh, traditional uh, financial institution. So we have uh, inserted a, a provision in that in that uh, in that effect, so that again some control is being put in place to make sure that the cash system of custodian is not being misused for transactions that are not related to the securities business. And then uh, probably, uh, since I see we have only 10 minutes left, uh, um, another one that I will mention is that we have introduced some provisions that were related to the type of due diligence to be put in place when accounts are being opened at the custodian. So you know that there are different types of securities accounts that could exist, uh, coming out omnibus, segregated, and we have uh, for foreseen some level of due diligence to be performed depending on the type of account that is being that is being opened because fair to say that an omnibus account is not necessarily bearing the same type of risk in terms of financial crime risk as a segregated account again that is the kind of thing we've tried to clarify to clarify in the questionnaire and i think i've spoken enough, enough for the moment thank you olivier so, I mean, I think just to, to summarize here and then to open the floor for questions, as you've heard, um, 
ISSA's uh, FCC principles and the associated uh, questionnaire that uh, Olivier spoke about, the new one that we're about to release, um, have already been adopted by many firms globally and are actually now already seven years old, the principles. Um, we believe uh, within ISSA that firms adhering to the principles have definitely made the industry a safer place. Um, as you, as uh, outlined by Olivier, there are risks out there uh, and it's important that these, these risks are managed. Um, and that by continuing to be guided by these principles, the securities industry, security services industry will be able to address the ongoing challenges posed by financial crime. So Olivier, at this point, I'd like to thank you for both your insights and for the comprehensive responses you've provided. Um, I'd like to thank the audience uh, for their attendance 